Hello, I'm Florian, one of the five co-directors of Hybrid. Hybrid was our student short film made in 2017. The idea came from Romain, and while he was diving when he was younger, he saw a shiny reflection underwater, and he, he wanted to know what it was because he thought like it was a fish, and in fact, it was like a bottle cap. The idea came from that and how the impact of the, uh, the pollution of the humans uh, can interact with like the wildlife. So that's what the movie is about. Um, I hope we, you will enjoy the.
Hello, I'm Emily Driscoll, and you're about to watch my documentary, Invisible Ocean, Plankton and Plastic. I'm thrilled the film is playing at Salty Cinema with this year's theme of Invisible, expanding our vision through science and art. Invisible Ocean explores the unseen threat of microplastics in the ocean through the eyes and artwork of environmental artist Mara Hazeltine, who found microplastics wrapped around plankton samples she collected on an expedition. I was inspired to make this film to spread awareness about the unseen threats of microplastics in the ocean, and also to show how art can visualize critical environmental issues facing the planet and connect to viewers on an emotional level. Awareness plus emotion spark action and change. Thank you and enjoy. I sort of fell in love with the Tintinid when I saw it. And I mean, for me, it was a very formal love affair. I was an artist in residence on a two and a half year mission called Tara Oceans, and they're studying the health of the oceans. They are literally taking the temperature of the ocean through the study of plankton. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine percent of the biomass in the ocean is actually the invisible stuff, bacteria and small unicellular organisms. I began collecting plankton from all around the world. It was love at first sight when I saw this, these tintinids through the microscope because of their resemblance to a champagne glass for a mermaid. And I also liked it that they were sort of mid-range up in the food web of plankton, so you could see all the phytoplankton inside them that they had been eating. As I collected more and more plankton samples, I found um, tiny shreds of plastic in all of them, no matter how remote the location was. And so oceans and seas that looked completely pristine actually had plastic in them. It may not be the visible plastic pieces that are the most worrisome, but the tiny plastic particles like fibers from a shirt that you wash that may be the most worrisome because these particles might get into the tissues of planktonic organisms, fish, and eventually in our tissues. We, do, we really don't know much about this danger. Microplastics are tiny particles of plastic less than one millimeter in size. They're micrometer-sized particles that are smaller than the width of, of a human hair. Microplastics themselves come from a variety of sources ranging from the breakdown of larger products like plastic bottles and bags to more direct sources from the textile of clothing, the small fibres that come off from washing machines. The smaller a particle of plastic gets, the more available it, it becomes to be eaten by a wider range of organisms. One of the main jobs for artists is to reflect um, what's going on in, at that time in history, even a microscopic scale. 
the health of the oceans and the health of everything on land is completely intertwined. And I think that if I can help illuminate that through artwork, that would be my goal. I've always found glass to be incredibly enchanting. Sort of like sculpting in lava. It's very visceral, it's very organic. Uranium glass looks extremely bright in natural light, but under a black light, it actually fluoresces. So it looks like bioluminescent phytoplankton. Because this sculpture is about the ocean being in peril, the fact that it's slightly radioactive because of the uranium is appropriate. I'm very interested in people relating to the shapes, but also the shapes being scientifically accurate. But in this case, I made the interior shape of the Tintinid look sort of like a damsel in distress. The sculpture is two Tintinid plankton ensnared in plastic that's been in the ocean for a long time. It just reminded me of the opera La Boheme where Rodolfo falls in love with Mimi who is actually dying of consumption. I want people to fall in love with Mimi. I want them to love the plankton and hate the plastic. So I'm looking for an emotional reaction, which leads to action. Individuals have an incredible amount of power here because it's the consumers who are actually buying the actual products. A lot of consumers expect that there would be well-grafted scientific knowledge to go into the decisions made to use a particular material. Unfortunately, the companies aren't looking at that. We're not anti-plastics. We actually think plastics can have a lot, an awful lot of good. We're just saying that for any material, the costs and the benefits really need to be weighed. You know, we estimate by 2050, we could be adding an extra 33 billion tons of plastic onto our world. If we have no idea about where most of this plastic is currently, what the problems are, this poses a huge problem for us. Life is a complex in interdependent system that you cannot have complex forms of life like us without having the whole chain of organism from bacteria all the way to animals. A lot of places are changing their plankton composition, probably because of the changing temperature of the ocean. And we don't know how you know, fast species can adapt. The microscopic world affects us as humans, and especially things that happen in the sea are kind of out of sight, out of mind. So microscopic things that happen in the sea are out of sight, out of mind. I wanted to make La Boheme larger than life so people could sort of see the drama and see what was happening and how that directly affects their lives.
Hi, I'm Andy Robinson. I'm one of the filmmakers for Vanishing Invisible Forests. Uh, we made this film because when you hear something like 90% of all kelp has died on the West Coast, it's really hard to understand that impact unless you go there and see it. And so we wanted to make a video, make a documentary that would sh actually show people what that looks like, what it looks like when an ecosystem collapses, and how climate change is affecting things that are happening right now in the world around us. Um, thanks. I started initially studying terrestrial ecology, but I stumbled into a scuba diving class where I learned to dive right here along the Monterey breakwater wall. It was a really rough day. The surf was big. We barely made it into the water. And I mean, we couldn't even hardly see our, you know, our hands in front of our faces because it was so murky, it's freezing cold, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. I was like, it, it can't get better than this. And from that moment, I just became fascinated by kelp forest ecosystems. My name is Josh Smith, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. I've been studying kelp forest ecology for about 11 years. Most of my research has been specifically in Monterey Bay. Being in a kelp forest is much like being in a redwood forest. Kelp grow really tall. They grow all the way from the seafloor up to the surface. They can grow up to 80 feet tall. The reef is covered in life of all kinds of different colors, invertebrates and fishes that are on the bottom. Underwater, there's life everywhere, all the way up to the surface. We set up surveys years and years ago. Uh, they started in 1992. It was in response to the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was up in Alaska but there was this recognition that we knew very little about these habitats. And if we were going to be able to assess damages, you kind of needed to know what was there. And one of the things that affords, of course, is that you have the opportunity to see change. And you can see that there are these coastal ecosystems, kelp forest and rocky intertidal areas, and things come and go and they change. My name is Pete Ramondi. I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. My primary interest is in kelp forests along the coast of California and rocky intertidal areas, which we think of as tide pools. Back when we were diving this area 2012-2013, the kelp was so thick that we'd have to anchor the boat way out here and then swim under the canopy to get to the location where we were going to do our surveys. Now we can pretty much just pull up right to our dive site, you know, drop anchor and go. But in 2013, things began to seriously change. It was shocking. I'd never seen anything like it. We saw starfish starting to disintegrate basically in front of us. We would see these things on the bottom that we called ghost stars, which were the outline of the sea star in white, and the white was bacteria. All these sea stars were basically just dissolving underwater. They lose their arms, they twist and get torsion, and it's really, it's, it's really pretty nasty. It was like the underwater world was, you know, like in its last stages. That sea star wasting syndrome decimated several species of sea stars up and down the coast. One species that was hit particularly hard was this sunflower sea star that we call Pycnopodia. And this is a very large sea star that grows to be the size of an extra large pizza. They have 24 arms and they cruise along the reef for sea urchins. And sea urchins are these spiny baseball sized animals that like to eat kelp. Now normally, in a kelp forest, these native sea urchin grazers are living down, tucked away in the cracks and crevices, and they're eating drift kelp. In 2014, we had a major marine heat wave. These marine heat waves are a product of climate change, and all of these anomalies are like nothing we've seen, you know, in the last 
you know, 100 years. One was the blob, which was this really warm seawater that showed up in the northeastern Pacific Ocean. And the other was this warm equatorial water that came up that was from a major El Nino event. And so this major marine heat wave just completely bathed all of central and northern California in this really warm water. And kelp needs really cold, nutrient-rich water to thrive. And so the combination of lots and lots of sea urchins and very bad environmental conditions for kelp caused the kelp forest to collapse. We're really hoping to learn more about sea urchin behavior. We want to know how much kelp do sea urchins actually eat and what's that critical point when sea urchins shift from passively grazing on drift where they're tucked away in the crevices to now storming out of the crevices eating live kelp. That's a really fundamentally important behavioral shift um, that we're really interested in learning more about. These sea urchins in many places completely clear cut the kelp all the way to the reef surface and formed what we call sea urchin barrens. And these are places where the urchins have overgrazed the kelp. There's no macroalgae left. It's just a carpet of purple. We've discussed the sea urchins that eat kelp, and we discussed the sunflower sea star, which is a known predator of sea urchins. There's another predator of sea urchins that we have here in Monterey Bay, and that's the southern sea otter. Part of the reason why we still have patches of kelp forests along the Monterey Peninsula is because the otters are helping to maintain those remnant patches of kelp forests they are targeting the healthy urchins in those patches of kelp. However, because the otters are not foraging on sea urchins in the barrens, they're not actively contributing to recovery. These are the, the major gracers that are eating all of the kelp. So these urchins, again, they emerged from crevices and, and they were no longer eating drift and they started eating live kelp. So in the lab, we're looking to see what actually causes that behavioral shift. How do predators play a part in that? It's been really remarkable to see how fast the, the ecosystem can change how quickly kelp can become de deforested and how quickly these sea urchin barrens can happen. And I wish I could just look back into time and see how often does this happen before? How long did the barrens persist? Were there barrens? Because to us, it seems like this happened really quickly. We lost all the kelp. And I have to you know, remind myself that my perception and my window into these changing forest ecosystems is just a fraction of time on the geologic time scale. The kelp forest seems to be recovering right now. And you know, we're in a period of really cold water, and at least recently, and things seem to be coming back in. We're in a pretty fortunate situation, to be completely honest, because I think that unlike a lot of environments, people actually are very interested in this. This interest has led to an immense amount of information that we would not have had. So like in the sea star wasting, probably 90% of the information we got was from people, citizens. And that's because they're interested and they care. And so I think that that's a huge plus. And you know, I would just hope that that stays. It's hard to speculate about what might happen. These are really dynamic ecosystems. There are all kinds of invertebrates and birds and things that depend on kelp as a subsidy. The kelp also ends up in, at, you know, offshore and in the canyon. And so the kelp that's ripped out eventually makes its way offshore, some of it sinks down. It's not just important for the animals that live there, but um, kelp forests are also fundamentally important in buffering climate change. And one way that they do that is like plants on land, kelp actually take in CO2. And when that kelp is ripped out and transported offshore, that carbon that the kelp has, has captured is ultimately sequestered into deep sea sediments. And what's so great about kelp? <laughs> You're not convinced already? Well, kelp is, kelp is what we call a foundation species. So it, it supports the entire 
forest ecosystem by providing habitat and food for all of the animals that live here. With all of these changes that are happening, what we're seeing is the foundation being unraveled. It's being deforested. And it's not being deforested because of harvest, it's being deforested because of these other processes that are happening, these marine heat waves and the sea urchin outbreaks that can occur over several hundred kilometers. With ocean warming globally and climate change, you know, like the blob that really initiated all of this back in 2014, that, that blob was this area of warm water that showed up in the Northeastern Pacific Ocean. And my understanding still that, you know, we don't really know why it showed up, it just did. And it's unclear how kelp forests are gonna to respond to these recurring marine heat waves. Hi everyone, I'm Darcy Hennessy, the director of the Ocean Solution. Um, I'm coming to you from Vancouver Island, Canada, visiting my parents where I grew up, surrounded by beautiful oceans and ocean aquaculture was a big part of our my growing up. Um, so when Patagonia Provisions commissioned me to make the Ocean Solution, it was something I thought was really interesting. Um, this piece is meant to be hopeful. It's meant to be enlightening and meant to offer solutions for everyday people who can change their diet, support these regenerative ocean farmers who are working um, in part for a climate solution through our oceans, hence the ocean solution. So I hope you find this film uh, inspiring, enlightening, and offer a sense of the little things we can do every day to help with climate change and slowing it down and the health of our oceans. So thanks for coming, enjoy the film. We know the climate is changing and it will continue to change, but how much it changes very much depends on what we do, especially in the next decade. One out of every two breaths of oxygen is coming from oceanic plankton. The ocean is our very best carbon sink, and we need to figure out a way to stop having the ocean carry such a load for us. We have to think beyond trying to protect and save Mother Nature, but use us as farmers to breathe life back into the ecosystem. Making sure people understand there's a different way is critical. We're at this point in human history where we all need to look at what skills we have and what we're good at and how we can use those to be a part of the solutions that we know are needed. I want it to be safe. I want it to be healthy. I want it to be restoring nature instead of destroying it. This is the way that I want my food to be. This isn't really about the environment for someone like me. If we don't protect ecosystems, there are no jobs, there is no food on a dead planet. I don't want to just fish for a while, I want to die in my boat one day. I was born and raised in Canada, in Newfoundland, in a small fishing village, and we measured fish, its freshness, within hours, not days. I dropped out of high school when I was 14 and headed out to sea. I was working at the height of industrialized fishing, tearing up entire ecosystems, chasing fewer and fewer fish further and further out to sea. And then the cod stocks crashed back home in Newfoundland. 30,000 people were thrown out of work overnight. And that's when I realized that as a fisherman, my job was then to figure out a way how to work with the ocean, ask the ocean what our relationship should be to it. I went on that journey and I started out on the salmon farms. And unfortunately, aquaculture made all the mistakes of land-based industrial agriculture. 
a monoculture using pesticides, fertilizers, fish escapes, all the things you think of. So I left that and then kept searching and ended up in Long Island Sound as a oysterman and had to shift into this sort of whole new identity as a, as a farmer. And then the storms hit. Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy came in, destroyed my entire farm. So here I was, once again in a situation where the ecosystem was destroying my small business, destroying my livelihood. Sort of a canary in the coal mine for a climate crisis that's come 100 years earlier than expected. For me, I look back, and that moment of crisis and failure was probably the most important moment of my life. Back against the wall, choosing whether I head back to land or do I go and figure out how to build a climate resilient farm out there? And I think that's kind of where we are as a society. Right? Our backs are against the wall. We can either give up, flee, and just let this planet die slowly, or we can innovate. And then it becomes kind of an exciting journey. So I'm an ocean farmer. Don't oh, wait. Um, I'm a regenerative ocean farmer. Imagine an underwater garden where we grow a mix of shellfish and seaweeds. And it's a pretty simple system. You have anchors down the bottom going up the surface and then horizontal lines down below. And from there, we grow our kelp vertically uh, downwards next to mussels. We have scallops and lantern nets and then oysters and cages and clams down below. The fact that our farms are vertical means that we can grow incredible amounts of food in small areas. So per acre, I could grow 10 tons of seaweed and 250,000 pieces of shellfish. If you were to build farms in less than 5% of U.S. waters, you'd sequester as much carbon as output as 20 million cars, create 50 million jobs, and the protein equivalent of 3 trillion hamburgers. Mother Nature abhors monoculture. She does not run single creature systems, right? She has all these different organisms working together in symbiosis. So as an ocean farmer, my job is to replicate that and use my kelp and shellfish to work together and build a system that's vibrant. It's also important to me as a small business person because I've got different species I can harvest year round, which diversifies the risk and especially the era of climate change. Storm comes through, wipes me out one season, well, I've got another crop that I can be harvesting the following season. And that creates community and economic resilience. So we think of polyculture all of from an environmental point of view. No, it's also essential from an economic point of view. We asked the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? And it turns out, it's pretty simple. Don't grow things that swim away or that you have to feed. And as soon as you change that mindset of not growing salmon, tunas, things like that, it opens up this whole world of regenerative ocean agriculture. Well, the ocean has an enormous capacity to produce food. And what we've done to date is really focus on catching wild fish but somehow we still expect these massive, magnificent tunas to be sustainable at scale. And that's just totally absurd because if tunas lived on land, they'd be like the dragon that eats a lion. They're so high up on a food chain, there just isn't something equivalent to that on land. And so we have to think about moving from catching wild animals in the ocean to farming. But if we farm animals, again, we wouldn't be farming lions if we were farming animals on land. And so when we want to think regeneratively, restoratively in the ocean, it's really important to think about where we're farming on the food chain. And the lower on the food chain, the better, the more efficient it can be in terms of producing food. The kelps and the shellfish, they require zero inputs. So that means no water, no fertilizer, no feed, and no use of land. And this makes it hands down the most sustainable form of food production on the planet. Our role isn't to catch or cage fish. Our role is to create ecosystems for fish. So, you know, our kelp, our oysters, mussels all work together and create this whole world that fish can come hide, thrive, and eat. And in fact, some of the best fishing in the entire area is on my farm, because we've rebuilt this ecosystem. We have to think beyond trying to protect and save Mother Nature, but use us as farmers to breathe life back into the ecosystem. Everything 
that we do ends up in the ocean and then comes back at us. We like to think of America as this bountiful land of diverse crops, but when we look at the heartland of the United States, we're really talking about just a handful of what are called row crops, corn, soy, wheat, and some other grains to some extent. Those crops are super fertilizer intensive, particularly corn. That corn isn't really coming to our plates directly. Mostly the corn and also the soy crop is being used to feed cows, pigs, chickens. So we're already losing energy by feeding this stuff to animals that we're then eating. And then when you consider on top of that, that a huge amount of these animals are being fed this corn in confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, which also produce this huge amount of runoff in the form of feces that gets into waterways, that it's like this double whammy that's extremely inefficient in delivering quality nutrients to our plates. It's so efficient to grow oysters and mussels and clams that it actually has a lower carbon footprint than being vegan as a source of protein. Beef is around 28 kilograms of CO2 for a kilogram of beef. Mussels can be 0.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every kilogram of muscle meat produced, which is incredible. When I think about the role of the ocean in our global ecosystem, I think right now a lot about its ability to be part of the climate solution. It helps soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. These incredible forests, sequoias of the sea. You take oysters, they filter 50 gallons of water a day, taking the nitrogen out of the water column. And of course, too much nitrogen in our oceans is the cause of ocean dead zones. A dead zone is when you have excess fertilizer on land that comes into the ocean that has this population explosion of algae, and then that dies, decomposes, uses up all the oxygen, and then it suffocates marine life. So this is a problem for ecosystem from bottom to top. The work around kelp farming is really interesting from a number of different perspectives. On the one hand, it is definitely pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, storing it in the actual tissues of kelp that we then eat. In the case of what Brand Smith is doing, it removes excess nitrogen. And, and that's really the game changer as far as trying to eliminate dead zones and so forth. And if we can get commercial forces doing that as part of their business plan, it's a win-win situation. Regenerative ocean farms are important for three reasons, I think. One is they're regenerative, soaking up carbon, nitrogen, things like that. Second way is they're replicable, right? So if you take 20 acres, a boat, and a lease, anybody can start their farm with 20,000 bucks. Right? That means that we're able to replicate fast. Think of it almost as the nail salon model of the sea, which requires minimal capital costs, minimal skill requirements, and that allows us to scale. About five years ago, we created Greenway, which is a nonprofit to train the new generation of ocean farmers. So it's not just sort of grumpy old fishermen like me, but we're bringing people from all walks of life into this industry. In the climate era, scale is essential. We can't do this small as beautiful anymore, right? We've got only got a couple dozen years and we have to move on this fast. We can have farms dotting our coastlines, and I think of them as Greenway reefs. You have 50 small-scale farms, a processing hub, a hatchery, rings of institutional buyers and entrepreneurs, and then you recreate those reefs up and down the coast. I talk to farmers and they all say there's a nutrient crisis on land, right? Whether it's the micro or macro nutrients, they've all been leached from the soil by corporate ag. Well, it turns out they're in the ocean. Whether it's carbon, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's all these micronutrients, I have those. So this is an incredible opportunity to build a bridge between land and sea. Right, and close that nutrient loops. I can use my shellfish and seaweeds to collect those nutrients and then we can bring them to land and the farmers can use them as fertilizer, which by the way has been done for hundreds of years. This is about a revival of traditions in an appropriate way for this climate era. But there is other possibilities too. So if you feed cattle a 2% diet of a type of seaweed, you get a 58% reduction in methane output. This stunning. Think, right? So again, let's leverage the sea to address some of the biggest challenges on land. And it keeps going, let's blend these whole systems. 
I think one of the reasons we're excited about this space is it allows us to do food right. Like the oceans are kind of a blank slate. So we can build a food system, an agricultural system from the bottom up and do it the right way. We can make sure we're doing polyculture, not monoculture. We can make sure we don't privatize our seeds. We can make sure that beginning and new and under-resourced families can begin farms. So we have a social justice element. And that's what's exciting. We can build this whole new economy out there. We're moving beyond this politics of no, but what's our politics of yes? Too often our thinking stops at the water's edge. Let's create that circular economy, that circular nutrient loop and circular food system. It's something like 80% of the world's oceans are unmapped and haven't been seen by humans before. Like more of the surface of Mars has been mapped than the bottom of the sea. And that's pretty fucked up. How are you supposed to take care of something when you don't even know what it looks like? So we created this lab to try to help fix that, where we go around and we map different coral reefs around the world. And we're focusing right now on mapping the coral reefs at some of the best surf breaks on the planet. Some people may not really get why we're going around and mapping these waves. Like, why are these nerds packing GPS devices and scale bars with their board bags on surf trips, but we don't really do science like everyone else. We're kind of not the stereotypical scientists, um, but we really enjoy doing it this way. We kind of need like a big win if we're going to prove to the world that there can be another way to do science. This year, like we wanted to really show that we could do something impactful. So I thought we should go to a massive reef system on a super hollow left-hander in a place where people know very little about what the reef looks like. And Fiji seemed like an obvious choice. What we're gonna learn about the reefs is something we've never known before, right? Like how that shape of the reef is shaping the wave. And then beyond that, how is this reef gonna change in the future? And when you know and predict how they change in the future, you're armed with the ability to protect them. Cloud break is like the most famous wave because it's just super long and there's nowhere else like it that just is perfect as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So people wanna be here, you know, <laughs> they wanna surf it. Mapping that is all about the target. It's like, I gotta hit that spot where the barrel breaks, right? Because it's so long, it's a much bigger challenge because you have this huge reef where 
there's different parts of the wave and it breaks differently as it gets bigger. So you can't just jump in and easily swim around the takeoff zone. The takeoff zone shifts, the barrel section shifts. If you look at pipeline, it's a reef like this. You go to chokes, you get a reef kind of like this. You come to cloud break and what you get is a reef like this. It is enormous and thus we need the team to be able to try and map this from all different angles and perspectives. We don't know if it's gonna work, but if we pull it off, it's gonna be pretty incredible. We've got the fucking best team, dude. We have a badass team. We've got Hanani, she maps reefs and islands from air. We got Malu, an engineer who can take the robots over the whole reef shelf section. And then we've got Kylie who specializes in getting up close and mapping each coral. Collectively, they're doing something that no one's ever done in the world, which is map an entire reef system where one of the best ways in the planet breaks. I can't map cloud break by myself. You want me to say that? Yeah, it'd be like, I mean, can you? I mean, I don't know. No, obviously <laughs> not. I could map cloud break on my own, but it would might take me weeks to do it. So I need a team of a drone pilot like Hanani, who's also a coastal geologist, one of the best, and Malu, who is an ROV operator to reach the depths of the of the coral reef. Okay, so we're gonna go over the plan on mapping cloud break. I'm going to do the shallow reef. Aonani's gonna do the drone imagery. I'll be getting the deep shells with the ROV, right? Yep. Sweet. And what do you need me to do? You're gonna carry everything. How about me? You had a close enough look already. <laughs> Oh my system to, to do a three. We'll keep eyes on it for, yeah, solid. Um, the video so awesome. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Thanks, guys. Hey, Amen. Hey. Oh, hey. Oh, oh no, are you okay? Yeah, ended up uh, face planting today. Oh, no. At the reef. Yeah. So, just probably a broken nose. Um, he sounded funny on the phone. And then when he walked up, I was like, oh no, he's got two boat plugs in his nose. He's either got the vid or something else. And then he walked into the light and then he had holes in his face. Kind of threw everyone off, but I don't know, it also put the trip in a place where we just realized, you know, we're gonna have to do whatever it takes to get the work done and hopefully drag him along with his bloody ass face and that he makes it.
What was difficult was first of all trying to pinpoint exactly where we should map. So we had this discussion last evening where we were like, we need data to figure out the best course and how we can ensure that we're actually mapping the section of the reef where people surf um, and where it produces like I guess the best parts of the wave. So that was definitely an ambitious goal within like 12 hours to be like, okay, how do we problem solve? How do we fix this? And how do we get what we need? Mapping this is how much? How much is this again? If it's the full 21, that's about 10 football fields. It'll just be so inefficient if we just map 10 football fields of reef that no one's even surfing. So if we actually have some sort of data, GPS data of where surfers move on the reef, then we can just map that part and it'll save us a lot of time and energy. The question is how are we going to get GPS data of that? Does anyone wear a watch on the wave? I mean, Rip Curl had one, the Garmin ones have it. Like there's a lot of GPS watches. It's tracking where the surfer goes. We could have hit up Surfline. Ask the guy, the crew there to provide some data and pass GPS waves from different folks. We needed GPS coordinates to map the reef to make sure we had the right path. And so we reached out to people at Surfline and also to Mick Fanning and a couple of other surfers who were more than happy to help us reach our goal. And it feels really good to have, you know, people collaborate, even if you're not necessarily a scientist, but just someone who loves the ocean. It's really supportive and awesome. Nick's bubbling, bubbling. Send an image. It's not downloading, but he's bubbling. Wait, Mick's sending something? Yeah, he's bubbling. Bubbles. What the fuck well, did he say? Basically, we're trying to get some cloud break reef data of his waves from his GPS watch. I asked him if he could send it and, oh, just saying he surfs mate. Okay. Oh, what? We might be in business. Yes. Dude, Mick. Huh, yeah? Yeah, these rocks are pretty cool too. You can see um, entire coral heads that have been cemented into the shoreline. I like to always remind myself that even though I'm coming to visit family, visit cousins, aunties, uncles, I'm still a visitor. Um, and the people of this place, they have a really deep knowledge of these places, of the relationships between the reef, between the island. And that's not something that you can learn overnight or on one trip. That's something that we need to respect the people of this place for that knowledge, and we need to listen to them. There is kind of a lot at risk right now. Thinking about how we do science in the mega lab and what separates us from other research groups is we're, we're not doing the kind of science that typically gets funded by normal science agencies. And because of that, we run the risk of not being seen as doing valuable science. And one way we can prove to the science community that our science is purposeful is to ask the local communities if they can benefit from it. But if the Fijians don't see value in our maps, if they don't see value and benefits from our models and they don't get excited by it, then I don't know how we're gonna justify keeping our research going in the mega lab.
storms here. I'm Hannah Bennett, I'm from Rotuma Island, and I'm the president of the Fiji Surfing Association. Being a Pacific Island nation and being on the forefront of the climate movement, we're constantly inundated with information and organizations that want to help, of course, um, but it's a lot to take in. And so that's why at the Fiji Surfing Association, we try to help vet that information and trickle it down so that it becomes relevant. You know, on the community level, we're the ones that are out, you know, fishing, surfing, making contact with this environment on a daily basis, right? So that information's got to be relevant to us and our, our livelihoods. So, Hannah Bennett from uh, the president of Fiji Surfing Association is here. So we got to tell the team, we got to get the models ready. Uh, hopefully she thinks it's worthy or useful. Do we have the models ready for her? Oh, it's rendering still, or is it finished? We're right at the finish line. Oh my God, she's here already. Okay. Wanna see one? Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so it's like just a nursery to show, like, uh -huh. you know, structure variation. Have the okay. others to show her too, but. Just wanted to have like one. Do do we have one cover. of Do we have one of Cloudy? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, we got them all up. Okay. This was just the one I was doing for like. Is she here? Okay. Uh, she's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Come, 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 come. Yeah, you can come. Yeah, yeah. Oh no. John's gonna take controls of the. You take a seat. <laughs> this is it. exciting. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm kind of gonna walk you through how it works a little bit. Yeah. So we, this is the mappings that like right. we need. So and where are we looking at? I'll show you cloud break first if that works. Yeah. It'll, like if you see right here, where this is it? spot. Where is it? Pretty rad. Wow. So that's what you guys have been working on. A lot of the surfers in our communities are like stewards, you know? So if you could compare and contrast what the different, the, the seafloor of the different breaks look like and how healthy some are compared to others, you know, maybe some of the surfers would be like, oh, what? Like, why does our, our reef at Suva look horrible and dead and you know what can we do to make it look more like cloud breaks or something like that you know it's it's our reef this is you guys have just mapped Nakurukuru Mailangi you know like half of the kids who are custodians and who have you know custodianship over this thing probably don't even know what the bottom looks like and to give that to them I feel like you could even this is on a more like deeper level but you can instill some sort of pride like oh that's so sick like this is what creates those magical waves, and yeah, that's what's relatable, 100%. Right on. Oh, wow. I had the conversation before you guys arrived with Papito, and then you arrived the next day. It's, it's almost, it's almost like watch what you wish for. You just make it. It kind of gets moochy, little teary. <laughs> It's been a cool journey. This is really cool. Last question, when will be this group coming back to Tavaro? Oh, because we need we're them talk about that and later. Plan, plan well for You know, when you see people come together and you see people from the community support the work we're doing, it's, it's pretty incredible and really humbling. It's an honor. It's an honor to be able to be on trips like this with people like this and working with groups like the people here in Fiji. Despite what happened to my face, uh, yeah, it's insane. It's insane. Like this, this, a little bit of cloud break is going to be inside of 
Me Now Forever, I always take it away. And I can't think of a better place to wear it proudly on my schnoz. Hi everyone, my name is Abby Dias with The Forest Stands Tall. Thank you so much for attending this amazing film event. I wish I could be there with you, but I'm currently in Northern California working to restore our bull kelp forest, which you'll see highlighted in the film. I created The Forest Stands Tall to raise awareness about our underwater forest. All the footage was shot in my local ecosystem, and I hope it might serve as a reminder that you don't need to travel far to see amazing things or to do something important. Have a great night and enjoy the film. Over four billion years ago, life began in the ocean. Some beings found their way to land, while others stayed in the comfort of the liquid world. But both of these life forms came to the same conclusion. There is strength in community. As we walk among redwoods, cedars, pines, and firs, or swim beneath canopies of glistening giant and bull kelp, we are humbled by the undeniable truth that the forest is greater than the sum of those who create it. All are carefully crafted to fit every crease, crevice, and niche. Together, they are responsible for more than one could ever accomplish alone. Resilience rises from this diversity. Rooted in lifetimes of evolution. A force to be reckoned with. 
in the ever-fluid and changing world. The forest stands tall. everyone. As I welcome Dr. Lisa Cartwright and our panelists up here to the stage, uh, I realize I also neglected to give our land acknowledgement earlier today. So I do want to um, share with, with everyone that we are visitors on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. And today the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural t traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. So I wanted to acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for our stewardship. I think our message with Cloud Break, especially the, the um, being visitors on land really resonated with me. So thanks for allowing that extra time to share that. So please uh, help me in welcoming uh, Lisa and our panelists here this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Um, so I wanted to start by saying that it's such a pleasure to be this close to the water, to join you from the main campus here at Scripps. And when I'm here, I always feel a very deep sense of the presence of the Kumeyaay people who occupied the cliffs and the coast and who farmed the water in many of the ways that um, we're now trying to reclaim and return to in some of the films that we saw tonight. So I wanted to start with Mike Connolly Misquich's uh, Kumeyaay Land Acknowledgement that he wrote for San Diego, San Diego State University when he was a professor there. He is now, uh, we, we have the great um, opportunity, pleasure to have Mike Misquich as a member of the PhD program in anthropology here where he's doing some of the most important work that, that many of these films are gesturing toward. And his acknowledgement is that uh, is a land one, and I'm going to do an ocean acknowledgement. So for millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been part of this ocean. This ocean has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the UC San Diego community and of the La Jolla region, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote the balance and the harmony we find inspiration from this ocean, the ocean of the Kumeyaay. And I have to ask Nan Renner to share with us the name for the Kumeyaay land here. Makulahoi. Ma Ma Thank you. OK, so um, now I want to move to my introduction of our speakers and my thanks to the group that has organized this event, which, um, how many years has this been going on now, Allison? How many, what, what? Seven or eight now. Wow, that's fantastic. The seventh or eighth iteration of Salty Cinema and the second live event since for the since the pandemic, which is, is amazing and wonderful. So I wanted to start out um, by saying congratulations and thank you to Loria Dandoy, Ocean, Boulay, and especially to Alison Kellum for leading the brilliant organizing and curating and programming of this event and um, for uh, bringing us in this invisible, with the word in in parens, expanding our oceanic vision through art and science. And um, I want to thank the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego for always being, for, 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 uh, really a century, that's actually true, being a partner with the arts on the other side of the campus and up and down the California coast. So I'm now going to introduce our speakers, our panelists. I'll start with Megan Dickinson. Dickerson. Megan Dickerson is an artist, a designer, community organizer, and in Megan Dickerson's role here, um, she is leading the uh, transformation of, of art and science at Birch Aquarium, where she is curator, um, bringing artists and, sci and scientists together to develop emergent and immersive exhibitions for a broad, age-diverse, 
and uh, diverse in many other ways, public really expanding the scope of Birch Aquarium. And much of it is being done under the, pla under the banner of play, of joy, of immersive interaction. Megan has facilitated happenings ranging from the bumpkin art uh, encampment, an annual artist takeover in Boston Harbor, to smell vision we didn't have any opportunities to have smell vision here, but I think we can all really feel like we can smell kelp after some of these films. Uh, at the core of Megan's approach to, oh, smell of vision in film. It's, a, it's like a historical phenomenon in film that's actually pretty cool. Um, and Megan, you are going to do that for us soon, right? Bring a smell of vision having to do with kelp and fish. I, I mean, you can't pass that up. Um, she's co created uh, Flexible at adaptable places where people can play in the ways in which they need and want to with and around the ocean and beyond. Dr. Jessica Kendall Barr is a Scripps postdoctoral scholar at the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine, and her work here at Scripps uh, builds upon her doctoral research at UC San Santa Cruz, which I take it is also Josh Smith's um, he's, he's, Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I love the coastal connections with Scripps and Santa Barbara around the ocean. Yeah. She compares the extreme physiology of elite divers, including humans, penguins, seals, and whales. She's a scientist by training, and her research has spanned uh, computer graphics, human sleep deprivation, and arthropod mating behavior. Lots to talk about there. Jessica's animations, illustrated children's books, and data visualizations convey science and its role in preserving underwater ecosystems. As a science communication specialist, she translates data into stories, graphics, and animations that promote research, outreach, and conservation, and um, through events like this. So you're one of the architects of this kind of forum, in, in a word. So uh, Cliff. Capono is a professional surfer, journalist, and a professor in the Arizona State University Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. And um, I was pretty excited when I read that combination of things together, which is just fabulous. He was born in uh, Hilo, Hawaii, on the eastern shores, and his life is divided between science and surf. And we're really happy to see you here with your nose in good shape. <laughs> Um, he has published peer-reviewed papers about his research in molecular bioscience, and he's produced award-winning films about indigenous activism, ocean conservation, global food security, and augmented reality. Cliff has been profiled in popular media from the New York Times to Surfer Magazine, and he can be found tinkering in the lab when he's not chasing the best waves on the planet. And we also welcome with you, your colleague, Shay, who's joining us from Reef. So welcome, Shay. Oriana Poindexter is a photographer and marine scientist focused on art, science, and marine natural resources. After studying visual arts at Princeton University and marine biodiversity and conservation here at Scripps, she became an expert in the sustainable food and uh, seafood and fisheries management arenas where she's been working for a decade with academic institutions, government agencies, and environmental organizations. Her photographic work has been featured from the Getty Museum to the Wall Street Journal, which I think is an amazingly fabulous scope. And she has created interpretive exhibits for the Aquarium of the Pacific and our own Birch Aquarium here. Based in San Diego, Oriana is working on the iridescent ones a book that visualizes the natural and cultural history of, uh, of shell species on the Pacific West Coast. So um, welcome, everyone. And I want to start off with some questions that have been um, put together by the architects of our event. And um, I have the honor of, of conveying some of our first questions. After I relate a couple of these questions for each of our speakers, I'm going to um, there was a microphone here a moment ago in the middle. Do we still have that microphone? Because I'll walk around the room. Is there, is there one that I can take? Can I, I can just take this one? OK. So I'm going to kind of um, 
let go of the podium here and walk around the room and ask you all your questions so that we can all get more deeply involved in the dialogue. So I'm going to begin. Give me a second to get to my questions. So the first question is for everyone. So whoever wants to answer first. Um, what sparked your passion for bringing together art and science? And how does the merging of the two um, work for you? Why does it matter for you? What drives you to bring these two fields together? Uh, well, I was thinking about this earlier today. And um, when I was, in, I was in Boston for many years, and we uh, formed a nonprofit called the Berwick Research Institute. And the goal was to use play as a form of doing research. So there's a lot of artists who left school and they were missing the critique of being in school and missing that sense of community. But they were also a lot of people who were aligned with M MIT. So it was just a lot of scientists from MIT, from the Media Lab and other places, and these artists. And it just, it was the most interesting place to be, the most interesting conversations. And so I think that's really what brought me to this kind of work because it's, it's so fluid. Right? You can go in so many different directions when you merge those two things. You're nodding your head. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, it really started with learning about science. And art was so integral to my ability to understand concepts in new ways and draw, literally draw connections between different concepts and use color to highlight um, things that would just stick in my brain so much better. Um, and then I started to use art to teach science and really was uh, astonished at how effective that was. Um, and then I think it was during my PhD where I really was able to do science with art. And that was pretty amazing <laughs> um, to be able to do data visualizations that really you know, sparked the connections and the insights for me. Um, so now I'm just making lots of tools and resources to help other scientists sort of use art in those same ways. Um, I'd say that for me, I kind of follow my visual curiosity and then that turns into projects that then I need to learn about scientifically in order to understand what I'm photographing and why that's so interesting. Um, and my favorite place to be is in the kelp forest. So um, that's an easy rabbit hole to go down and <laughs> um, get really, really obsessed with um, becoming familiar with that environment, photographing that environment. And then kind of naturally that leads one to want to learn about that environment and understand what makes it be the way it is and um, what, it, what uh, factors affect it and, and how that visualizes. Um, and then to be able to share that with other people who might not have the ability to go dive in a kelp forest um, is something that is really uh, important to me as well. Um, yeah, I, I feel like... Um some of the mentors that I had, they were just very creative people, like scientists, successful scientists, and I kind of always would question why they left, like they, were, they excelled at something else that was very like, artistic, but then they came into the lab and they were successful in their research. And I just always didn't really understand why there was a disconnect and why the science community doesn't necessarily support the bridging of this creative mind, they only support it. I mean, not everyone, but a lot of the community only validates the creativity in getting grant money or writing a paper or something like that where they, they separate part of them. And I just thought that it was always um, a bit unfair. So for me, I was kind of like, I'm not going to compromise against like a lot. Of, for people who remember when I was here, I had some dramas getting through the program because I refuse to give up some of those things. So in, in my mind, um, art and science never was separate. Um, and just being stubborn to try to prove it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. How. That's a, an amazing um, array of answers. And I think it really shows that we've really moved on from the division, the hard division that we used to imagine existed between the two fields. I'm going to. Um, put on the spot or organizers of the event to be asking the next question. Do you mind? Because I feel like you really should be in the spotlight for this. You've done so much work. Can I? <laughs> I'm going to come over and bring the microphone. 
Do you want to come up? Come on up. <laughs> I don't mind, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Ocean. Um, yeah, I got to work on this really pretty piece, so definitely, by, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, incredible artist. Um, I, this is such an array of like incredible humans in front of me. I was like marveling. I love all of your answers because it's so true that art and science coalesces, especially when your muse is the ocean, right? Um, so yeah, <laughs> let's dovetail to the next question. Um, one of the films tonight spoke about how science inspired the forms and shapes of art. But is the reverse true? Does being an artist and thinking creatively affect your scientific endeavors? And I think maybe this would be a great question for Cliff, Jessica, and Oriana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, for, for me, I, like I said before, the, the way that I get really interested in things is visually first. Um, and when I was actually a grad student here, um, the project I ended up working on for my master's capstone was started out as a photographic project. Um, I was really interested in fish markets because they were these like fascinating inside out spots where the ocean had been turned inside out and categorized and labeled and the fish were so beautiful. Um, and I wanted to just photograph them. And my advisor was like, why don't you collect some data while you're at it? Um, <laughs> so that, yeah, that kind of snowballed. But um, definitely for me, that's how I become interested in, in things and how I decide that I'm going to go down that kind of rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah, so if I remember the question, it's kind of about art inspiring science. Um, and I, I, I get a little bit dizzy thinking about which affects which and <laughs> um, which is sort of uh, pristine and not affected by the other because they're very integral in my mind. Um, but I would say that uh, at least through my PhD, I was really obsessed with discovering the answer to a, a kind of uh, niche question. <laughs> and I remember meeting some people in my PhD, and they're like, I love meeting PhD students because they're always obsessed with the most random things. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the question that it, like kept me up at night, and every time I would drive back from Año Nuevo, which is where I was doing my field work on elephant seals, I would look out at the ocean, and it was often, you know, like North Coast, California, huge waves. And I'm just like, what are all those animals doing out there? Like, how are they OK? <laughs> um, and specifically, how do they sleep? So how do these seals sleep when they're at sea? And I think in my field, there had been sort of this way of studying how marine mammals sleep, which unfortunately involved kind of an invasive procedure where the skin would be cut and um, the electrodes would be attached to the skull. And I really wanted to find another way to do that. So I spent the next three years <laughs> soldering wires and learning how to engineer and trying to uh, detect signals from the surface of the skin so that we could record them the same way that we record sleep in humans. Um, and I think that, you know, that's maybe a different take on your question, but that r involved so many, like, sketches and notebooks and, like, why isn't this working? And wire diagrams, <laughs> colored wire diagrams, lots of design, yeah. Um, so I think that that, that was my journey. <laughs> yeah, I, for me, I think my uh, art is um, storytelling. And that's something that I try to do when I surf. I, I try to tell a story on the wave um, in the lab. I try to tell a story in the science. So for me, that's kind of my, my art. And I think um, it's just more engaging for me to, with people um, when it's a creative way of telling that story. I just like, went to Fiji, bust my face, map some reef. Like, you know, I try to do it in a way that's a little more uh, intimate and I think that's the creativity that art really um, supports the science. Great. I wanted to follow up with you, Jesse, a little bit because I was, I was whispering to her, it's design, it's design. So um, one of the big initiatives at UCSD in the past 10 years has been to 
um, really advance the way that the field, field of design brings together scientists and artists across things like how do artists go about making decisions? It's, not, it's partly, as Oriana was saying, it's partly about beauty and just being inspired by the awesomeness of nature, um, but it's also about um, the kinds of things that technology can do, not just to take away nature and life forms, but to, um, to try and slow the very destruction that nature has suffered under technology's reign. And so I see that kind of coming through in your work, where you've, you've brought design in and created these, these new technologies. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think that in, in science as an artist, we have this need to legitimize the work that we do as artists, the time that we spend on art and, and those projects that sometimes take us away from publishing papers, for example. <laughs> um, and I think one way that I've been able to legitimize it, at least in, in using words to describe what I'm doing, is using words like design, Often I use the word engineering instead of drawings, um, but, but I think that we need to tear down that stigma. <laughs> um, I also do data visualization, and I think that sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm creating models, but it's only legitimized if I call it a model, not if I call it, you know, art. Um, and yeah, I would like to break down those. <laughs> I'm, I'm really fascinated hearing about this because in my, um, my conversations and my readings in some of the foundational people in the visualization lab, which was one of the, the really important places, and I know Jules Jaffe is here with us, um, who did very important work in developing cameras, underwater cameras, before the digital era. Um, that often, these are people who really came out of engineering, electrical engineering in some cases, and these are people who also maintain art practices. Um, Jules is a woodworker, so this connection between Science and art through engineering and design, I think, has been trans-historical and it's really under-recognized but super critical. So, um, speaking of design, I, I wanted to ask. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, in terms of design, experience design, um, designing um, spaces, can you talk a little bit about this, Megan, in terms of the way that you? you consider your curatorial work to be an artistic practice, a design practice. Yeah, I was thinking about how uh, a mentor of mine, Stuart Lester, said the first rule of play, if there is a rule to play, is paying attention. And I think that's what happens in an art practice and in a science practice. You're paying attention. You're paying attention to different things. I think that art allows you to be a little bit more divergent <laughs> from these things that you're supposed to be paying attention to and tracking. And so I think about that in terms of creating spaces for people to engage with and play. You're just paying attention. You're noticing what are people doing and what do they need to do more of and what are, you know, where does that go? I think versus what typically happens in exhibit making in an institution like like Birch Aquarium or a science museum is you start off with this topic and you try to make it interesting to people. And I don't like to do that. <laughs> I like to start off with what are people doing? What do they desire? What are they needing? You know, it's a really design thinking approach. And then you're building onto that. And I find that the stories start to tell themselves. And you get much more closer to that idea of the content if you start with play and love and all those other things. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... It's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And it, it resonates so much with, with Cliff's work and Cliff, what you had to say about um, your insistence that you weren't going to give up what you love and that you were going to continue to engage in the ocean as a place of play and joy um, as, and not see it as totally separate. I felt that really came through in your work with the community when you brought people from the community in to see your work. I mean, just the joy on um, Hannah's face when she got it. She's like, oh, this is what they're doing. Now I can show my peers who are stewards of the ocean what the ocean floor looks like, and that's really going to enrich their experience. So I thought that was just a great, um, although you two didn't know each other before, it's really a great way of, of thinking about play in science. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that or... That's good, okay. 
anyway, maybe this is a good moment to turn to the audience and ask. Um, I'm just going to walk around with the microphone so you don't have to come up. Who would like to comment? Oh, sure. Thank you. It's just easier for a videographer. Okay. Any questions? Anybody up in the gallery? We're just amazed by the coolness of the people in front of us. <laughs> yes. Kick us up. Uh, Dr. Kapana, maybe you could give us some insight. Did you find the spot on the reef, like where? You're Face sure. <laughs> Sorry, to restate the question, did you find the spot where your face was? Yeah, so um, when we, because it's so, it's so large, that whole Kurukuru Mairangi Cloudbreak Reef, um, I don't know if it came across in the, in the short film, but um, we reached out to Surfline because um, surfers, I don't know how many surfers, there's probably a lot here, but um, you can get a watch that does your GPS and things like that. So we wanted to do like a citizen science component to it, which we're, um, we're writing a, a paper now about um, human reef interaction through GPS uh, mapping. But um, the place I hit my, my face is a place where they tell you don't go. Uh, <laughs> so there's very small data points there, so we didn't actually map it. Um, so, yeah. No. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I have a, a very young friend sitting here, and uh, she is a high school junior. And okay, she I'm your daughter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, the reason that I was like, it, fascinated about this uh, film and this event is that she is exactly that at the moment, wondering, she's a junior, right? Has to select college, and then she wants to do art, and marine science, so she couldn't, you know, possibly uh, do both. And uh, in terms of uh, choosing this, and uh, career-wise, the guidance. Uh, so, could you, uh, some of them, uh, give her some insight on how should she uh, consider an approach? Um, you know, it's a dilemma. She loves both. She likes animation, and uh, she has her. Uh, art portfolio, but now she temporarily decided to apply for marine biology. <laughs> she, by the way, she is um, uh, volunteering at the Birch Aquarium right now. So I, I would just say do both, and like Cliff says, be stubborn. Um, <laughs> there's no reason you can't do both, um, as long as they continue to be interesting. So at UC San Diego, we have right now majors that are in both visual arts, doing film and media, and who are also in, for example, geosciences. So this, I think this is really a, a growing field that you all have pioneered. I hate the word pioneered, sorry. That you have all found it. Um, well, yeah, I guess I'll add just that uh, I found my way into animation through YouTube, and uh, if you don't necessarily want to major in art or animation, you can still be considered a legitimate artist, and there are so many pathways to becoming both an artist and a scientist um, that I, w I wouldn't discourage you from, you know, taking like more playful approaches to learning first and see what feels good and try it out. and. And then, yeah, maybe a double major or a major that combines the two. There's, there's infinite possibility. <laughs> well, I can speak on behalf of a colleague who's not here, who started at UCSD as a science major, and then she discovered the art department, and she graduated with an art degree and started working at Birch Aquarium. And she's been there for 20 years. Um, <laughs> But so she helps us create the artwork and the exhibits that are conveying these, these critical ideas. So she's an artist with this kind of background and it's, it's both those things. I think that we keep, like, like you're saying, we're, we're getting past the point where you have to really decide one or the other, that it's this sort of choice. You know, you can do both, I think. And it's about how you do it. Art isn't how you do it versus, you know, 
some very clear division, I think. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I also had a follow-up question. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up before? Follow okay, all right. I was gonna, that was such a good question. Because how do we get into the space of storytelling, right? Science is telling stories, and so is art. They're both substrates, <laughs> right, for stories. So I am so curious, do you have a favorite storyteller? If that's a scientist, an artist, a one that is a North Star for you. Yeah, um, my, my, I'm real fortunate to come from a culture where we have a lot of stories. So for me, um, it's like the uncle at the party or the auntie, but it's, um, it's not just their lifetime stories. Sometimes it's intergenerational stories, which is like that inspiration to um, just modify it. It's, it's, a, it's an old way of thinking, but it's just a new person experiencing it. So the stories are pretty killer from a long time ago. It's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure to pick a single storyteller. Um, but I will say that, um, yeah, maybe a cop-out answer, but I, I really love working with scientists and I, I work like on freelance projects where I work with specific scientists and I love that initial interaction where they're telling you a story and, you know, sometimes they're, like, navigating it a little bit awkwardly and they focus a little bit too much on the technical details. <laughs> but I think teasing out the narrative there and, and, and getting to know how, how they see their data, how they see it impacting the world, like, I think that that storytelling experience is, is really valuable to me. Well, I would also say Octavia Butler, if you haven't read Octavia Butler, you know, she wrote that you know you need to, in order to talk about science in the ways that she talked about science you need to know it before you can play with it right and so I think that that's she's somebody who I think about um, as prescient right obviously like predicting in some ways where, where we're at now but how are you able to tell those stories in a way that that people can see them in their lives yeah I was wondering if you guys could provide for us just a quick snapshot of those moments where your insistence about the connection between art and science became transformative. I think the, if I was going to use a standard, Cliff said that he had a lot of drama trying to insist that art be part of the science. Um, I'm pretty sure that you were running into this when you were using, saying that when you had shifts in language, uh, then you found yourself more accepted versus um, ostracized, and I'm sure that each of you have had experiences that are similar to this, so I was wondering if you could each maybe share an insight into how it was that you managed to surmount the resistance that was in front of you, and um, any advice you might be able to give to the rest of us about how we might be able to do it in our own lives. Yeah, I think the responsibility falls, you know, sometimes on us, but I think it should really lie more in institutional funding structures, I think we should fund artists more. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> that would create just more a better science communication, better collaboration. Um, I think that a lot of the resistance that I encountered could have been resolved with like, you know, just clear valuing of the, of the arts and of the social sciences in STEM. Yeah, I'm going to echo that. I personally don't feel like I have ever had one moment where I have gotten past that. Um, it's a kind of ongoing uh, movement towards both myself letting myself validate the more artistic side of things um, and the external world also validating that, that side of things. Um, but it's an ongoing process, absolutely. Um, there's definitely more accepted value in the technical side of things versus the artistic side of things. I'll, I'll just try to give the abbreviated version because I feel there's like millions of 
times where I had to prove it. Um, but basically, I was trying to get research funds to study coral reef, really cared about the corals and all that stuff. Um, and then I was on the verge of leaving uh, UCSD. And I said, kind of fuck it. I'm going to write my, what, what would I want to make if I could have unlimited funding? So I wrote this project about traveling around the world, sampling surfers, and seeing if surfers are connected through their microbiomes. Shot in the dark, put it out. UCSD Global Health funded it, funded my last two years of my PhD. And I went on this tr surf trip, like, it was literally like just Q-tips on people and surfing, and it was like, felt real selfish, super fun. Mm. Then the New York Times picked it up, and it went in there, and all the teachers who were failing me and were like, kind of you're a scrub to like <laughs> thumbs up in the hallways and things like that so like I feel like um but at that time I was I was negative 114 dollars I have the picture on my phone still like I was failing out it was gnarly it was like really to the point of like if this doesn't work then it's like I have like nothing to lose but I feel when I got to that point feeling I had nothing else to lose questioning if a PhD was even worth it trying to validate myself in a culture that I don't necessarily feel like I belong to. Um, gaining validation outside of my lab, gaining validation outside of my institution, gaining that on a broader level, it, it meant a lot. And I think that's what empowered me to say, it's not up to the PI of where I'm gonna go in life. It's not up to my school, it's not up to my paper. Um, I think there's a lot more that everyone offers and I think the weirder your um, things are that you're into, <laughs> like on opposite ends, like kelp and baking, I don't know, that, that's not even that weird actually, it's like, uh, get this, yeah, the, the, maybe like, um, I don't know, it just the weirder it is, the more it, it seems like it's gonna work because we're caught in this hamster wheel of like trying to get on Nat Geo and it's like, that's kind of out, I, I would say. You know, I mean, it's, it's important, but there's other um, opportunities out there that I think once I got into that, the rest was just kind of bonus. Where were you at right before the internal validation of the enzyme? Uh, I, 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 I probably had some, um, honestly, some depression and some regret and some confusion. Sure. So like I was going through a lot of like internal issues as a student yeah. that I'm sure we all felt maybe. And now like, dude, I'm faculty. Like I know, like professor, like it never ends. Once you get your PhD, it's just even, it's still gonna happen. Then you're gonna get tenure issues and you're gonna get it, whatever faculty, like it's just everyone is trying to like one up you. It never ends. Like this chase is gonna be until you die. So stop chasing and just start doing what you wanna do. And I think that's the kind of the, you might not be like turn into anything, but you'll be happier. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to stay in the game longer if you're happier. Hello. Um, thank you for all of your answers. It's been super inspiring. And it actually led into my question, which is um, about the Cloud Break film, but also interested to hear everybody else's thoughts. Um, I'm a local entrepreneur and also an environmental scientist, and I'm trying to bring a big vision to life. Um, and I know you mentioned that having a partnership with Reef helped you bring your film to life. So I was interested, like, how did you make that happen? Um, did you just know people and you know have you know a, a good in, or how would you suggest um, people who want to bring those types of visions to life in film? Yeah, um, so I, I met, I was actually, I, I went against my, you know, approvals to go to a, a Washington DC at Surfriders Hill Day, which advocated for, advocates, advocates for ocean health in the policy and things like that. And I'm meeting Shea Perkins um, while I was still in a previous relationship with another footwear company. But um, we hit it off, but maybe I can give the, the mic to Shay, and Shay can just speak how, what, I don't know why Reef even cares to mess with me, but I'm stoked, so maybe Shay, being uh, on behalf of Reef, can explain that. 
put me on the spot, Cliff. <laughs> no, I think the relationship, um, just like any good relationship, you know, uh, starts off with an awkward date and uh, <laughs> get to know each other. No, but I think me and Cliff, we connected on a level that was beyond my role at a brand, right? We make stuff, but I'm out in DC for the same reasons he is, to better understand ourselves and um, you know what people that represent us at, in Washington on, a, on our behalf. Um, and you know that was just kind of the, the, the first part and we stayed connected over the next couple years and um, we reconnected when his current relationship at another brand was <laughs> when he legally can talk to me. And we just had a conversation, I think. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, the Reef brand, I think, is, you know, we're a brand been around for about 40 years. We make sandals, you know, beach stuff that you need. Um, but we truly believe that, you know, healthy oceans, beaches, and reefs are absolutely vital for a brand like Reef to continue to do what we do. Um, and bring joy to everyone's feet and their lives, right? So with that said, we're, you know, I'm thinking about like what we believe and I'm like, okay, well, reefs in there. We believe ocean beaches and reefs should be healthy. Now, what the hell are we doing about it exactly? And when I started at the brand 10 years ago, um, it was a question that I just could not answer and I didn't, I never felt truly 100%. Uh, I felt a little guilty of that, you know, it was something that we did not address and I, and I don't think it was anyone's fault. I think... Um, you know, built in our DNA, we want to do the best um, for our environment, and we're fully 100% um, dedicated to a long-term relationship with with everything that I've just discussed. But when it came to reefs, I was like, we we need to have conversations with experts, with people that are fully dedicated to um, action around saving our our planet's um, important reefs, and specifically the stuff that we talk about all the time are the most incredible surf destinations we love to surf, right? Like the reefs that shape these beautiful waves that we ride, and we know very little about what these reefs really look like and, and what shapes them. So um, really neat kind of full circle moment with me and Cliff, and we, we decided to really jump into a relationship um, or you know, sign up for um, a relationship that's got us here a few years later, and we've been able to redefine uh, from a brand standpoint, what we're actually doing alongside the most incredible scientists that are absolutely just uh, inspiring, inspired me since day one, but just incredible people, family men and women, surfers, um, all Shay, the above. We're so, we're so yeah. glad to have you here yeah. amidst one of the concentrations of, of the most amazing um, oceanographers and artists in California and the world. And we really should all talk in future about, you know, a reef chair yeah. in yeah. marine bio art. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have some phenomenal projects here, so we should really create, you know, I noticed Agnes Bay as a label up there, um, which like high-end women's French fashions is supporting oceanography. How cool is that? Yeah. And in, you know, the familiar Patagonia, but this, I think this is just an incredible opportunity to really continue and expand this dialogue and you know, formalize it as much as we can. 100%, it's a pleasure to be here. Don't want to take up any more of your guys' time. I think, yeah. lastly, it was just, um, like I said, it's, it's first of many, right? We wanted to redefine and reshape what a relationship could look like um, from a brand like Reef and someone like Cliff, so. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. I think we have one more question in the back. This will be our, unfortunately, our last question okay. because we're hoping to have informal conversation. Um, hi, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your time. And I just had a question because um, me, I'm a second year UCSD marine bio major, actually. And I also do art as well. But one thing I've never really been able to figure out was where to start because I have all these, all these drawings, all these pieces that I have, but I was never sure what to do with it, who to go to. So I was wondering if there is some maybe advice that you could give me and other people here who may be in the same situation. Just, 
just start just start showing it to people, show it to your friends. You, I mean, social media is what it is, but it's um, one of the best things that it is, is a platform for you to share your art with the world. Um, and that is somewhere you can start. I have shown my work in friends' basements. I have shown my work in coffee shops. I've shown my work in aquariums. I've shown my work in galleries. Like it, one thing leads to another and you, just have to start somewhere, and if your friend has an empty basement and you can put an art show on there, why not? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, um, I double down on that Instagram social media aspect because a lot of curators actually use Instagram as part of their practice. You know, they're looking for, um, to get, get exposure that way, but the DIY shows are really important, I think, you know, just putting it together um, because it's, you know, a place like Burge Aquarium, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out a show there. Now, Oceans at Night, everybody, has anybody heard about Oceans at Night? Yeah, okay, so Oceans at Night is sort of our playground. Kelly Drummond's been doing some work with us, experimenting a little bit. Ocean might do something, you know. So it's a place where, um, you know, we can start to think about how do we just try something out? You know, like low pressure, it's at an interesting audience, you know, um, just trying out that intersection in those places. Yeah, like make a website, uh, curate an Instagram. I, I sold basically all of my first pieces through posting it on Instagram and saying, if you want this, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say if it doesn't seem like it's ready right now or if it doesn't seem like it's taking off and there's going to come a time where that opportunity will come and I think you just want to be ready like is your art on a global level and just get to that point where like you feel because making a, a piece that moves you can be the definition maybe to some people of what art is but art also comes with all those scientific aspects of communication, deadlines, emails, publications, it's, it's very scientific. So being ready for that when that opportunity comes, I think is, is the difference between it being successful or it just being like a hobby. When someone sees, oh, this guy's art is badass, but he also shows up on time. He creates a synopsis. He can communicate through different outlets. That'll put you right in the front line versus the scatterbrain artists who can't get things across the board and the scientists who don't even care about art. So you're in a, in a, a really great position that again, if it's not now, it's gonna, something's gonna happen soon and you just wanna be ready for that opportunity. Like I was 27 when I got my first paid contract from a surf brand after moving up here. So like, I'm like, I'm in a time when guys' careers are, you know, twilight of it and I'm just kind of getting ramped up and without science I don't think I'd be as interesting to the surf industry so you you have two crazy weapons with you that when that battle comes up or whatever you're you're, you're ready to go come and talk to us in the visual arts department for sure and that's an invitation also to our young sci artist who earlier asked a question come and talk to us I want to um, have two rounds of, of appreciation and applause here, and one is for Ocean, Luria, and Allison for organizing this event. <laughs> and then cheers for our panelists. So everyone is invited. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lisa, for a wonderful discussion and our panel and our impromptu panelist as well for, for joining our discussion. And thank you all for your wonderful questions as well. Um, I want to extend a special thanks to our philanthropic co community for um, sponsoring CNBC. We're continuing to look for donations to make this a continuing project. Um, 
we, we've been able to hold it for now for eight some years, 12 some events, but um, continued support uh, allows us to make it free for all. Uh, I also want to thank our student team, as Lisa mentioned, Ocean and Loria, and also uh, Dane Wicker, who is here hiding behind the scenes, who's been doing so much with Dane and Ocean, or with Loria and Ocean, and Vivian Howe, uh, who is not here this evening. Um, but they brought it from a seed of an idea into what it is tonight. So, so please find them and share your uh, thanks. Also, Loria and Dane defend their capstone symposium on June 13th. There's some information in the lobby, so they've been doing this um, under duress, <laughs> preparing for their capstone master's presentations. Also, thanks to our many, many student volunteers, um, Shristen and Cody, who are helping with our videography tonight, as well as everyone you met at our, um, our intro tables, and also our artists in Artist Alley. Please go say hi and see their amazing work that they've brought here for us tonight. So now we hope we can continue these conversations in our reception. We have food for you and some drinks, so please enjoy. Thank you again for coming.